Good evening. I want to welcome everybody to uh, our 2022 uh, kickoff of uh, Sages Turn Path Unknowns or Happy Hours. <clears throat> After our long break and getting ready for a, a season of concentrated Durham Path study, uh, for, for those of you who are uh, going to be sitting from the, for the upcoming core exam, that would be a good idea to do a potpourri just to help us get our, uh, our head back in the game. So the selection of eight cases that I'm going to be discussing. Um, as is always the case, uh, I'll be checking the chat from time to time. Uh, if you have any questions uh, that uh, you want to, to send to, to me or anybody else at a later date regarding this uh, material, uh, you can um, submit them to education at sagesdx.com uh, or you um, uh, can email me directly, tdavis at sagesdx.com. Uh, we do have an upcoming uh, Durham Path Core exam uh, review session scheduled for the last Saturday of the month, uh, Saturday, uh, January 29th. We'll be starting at uh, uh, noon, the discussion of cases. The cases and the um, question sheet uh, will be available roughly a week to 10 days before um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, set, the cases are discussed. The session will be recorded uh, and posted on our Vimeo channel. Uh, it's going to be password protected, so we would ask that you register for the session, even though you uh, are not um, going to be attending. And again, the, uh, the information is available uh, uh, on the uh, web website uh, at uh, uh, April. Just put the, the link uh, on the uh, on the chat. So anyway, um, next week I'm going to be uh, doing a five case CPC, and so hopefully you'll be able to tune in for that. The clinical images and the uh, path should go out uh, <clears throat> a little bit later this week. <coughs> Excuse me. So without any further hesitation, we'll go ahead and begin the discussion of uh, today's cases. Our first case, case one, is a case of uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. And uh, we have a uh, bread loved shade biopsy uh, in these sections. As we move to higher power, you can see that the epidermis is irregularly hyperplastic and there's scale crust within the uh, stratum corneum. And there's a dense and uh, somewhat diffuse, vaguely nodular infiltrate uh, filling the dermis and extending to the base of the biopsy specimen. And what really catches your eye are all these clear spaces or vacuoles uh, within the dermis. I, to my eye, they look a little like soap bubbles. And whenever I see that appearance uh, in a nodular infiltrate, one of the things I always uh, think about is leishmaniasis. As we'll see, uh, because of the, the, these vacuoles are actually present within histiocytes, and because of the tendency uh, of the organisms in leishmaniasis to segregate to the periphery of the cell, you get a cleared out space centrally. So uh, this soap bubble-like look can, can be a clue to the diagnosis of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Well, if we, if we go down and take a look at the infiltrate, we can see it's actually uh, fairly mixed. Uh, out at the periphery, we do have some of these vacuolated histiocytes, uh, but we've also got more conventional epithelioid histiocytes. Uh, there are a fair number of lymphocytes, and in many areas of the section, uh, of the sections, there were a lot of plasma cells present within the infiltrate. And plasma cells are routinely and regularly seen in lesions of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Uh, we tend to associate them with spirochetally mediated disorders such as syphilis, but there also <clears throat> can be a clue to the, to the diagnosis of leishmaniasis. Uh, and if we begin to look at higher power, uh, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit here, at these clear standing spaces. Again, they're vacuoles within histiocytes and clustered at the periphery preferentially in most of the histiocytes, there are these one to two uh, or two to three micron organisms that are present intracellularly. Now, a few of them are located uh, kind of in a in non-uniform fashion within the, the cytoplasm of the histiocytes within these vacuoles, but most do line up at the periphery forming what we call the marquee or uh, 
Ferris wheel sign. And this is very characteristic of um, leishmaniasis. The size of the organisms can really be determined by taking a look at the accompanying inflammatory cells. If you remember that lymphocytes and um, uh, RBCs have a, a nucleus in the range of five to seven microns, then th that can always be a ruler or a gauge. And you can see that these organisms uh, uh, in uh, the cytoplasm are much, much smaller. The key differential here obviously is histoplasmosis. Uh, another infectious organism caused in uh, my, in this case, uh, histo by uh, fungus, uh, that is also characterized by uh, the location of organisms of similar size uh, in the cytoplasm of histiocytes. With histoplasmosis, however, the organisms are evenly scattered throughout the cytoplasm. There's no tendency for them to be peripherally located uh, at the uh, at the margin or uh, 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 outside of the, the uh, cells. And so you don't get the formation of uh, the marquee or Ferris wheel sign. So uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. Uh, moving on to case number two. Case number two was just a really nice example, I thought, of granuloma annulari. Uh, we have a scoop shape here with kind of a tapered bottom. And uh, within the dermis, of all three pieces, you could see nodular collections of cells. The epidermis is uninvolved. I think we'll stick to the middle piece here. And uh, the infiltrate is composed of cells with uh, round to oval nuclei and fairly abundant uh, pale or pink staining cytoplasm. So these are epithelioid histiocytes. Some of the cells are multinucleated. A few uh, are attempting to form pa palisades, but most are located interstitially between collagen bundles. And in areas you can see the collagen bundles are pushed apart by an increased amount of uh, dermal mucin. Uh, this is a real patchy infiltrate. Uh, and uh, this, is, this histology, of course, is very characteristic of granuloma annulari. There can be at times some histologic overlap between granuloma annulari and uh, necrobiosis lipoidica. Uh, you know, they can, they can both localize on the lower extremities and both uh, can be seen more frequently in diabetic patients. With granuloma annulari, you almost always have intervening areas of normal collagen. So it's really more of a nodular dermatitis than a dense diffuse uh, dermatitis. With NLD, you tend to get top to bottom, side to side infiltrates. The histiocytes tend to have a layered appearance uh, and between the layers of histiocytes, there is degenerated collagen and it tends to have more of a squared off appearance rather than a, uh, uh, a tapered bottom. Uh, moving on to slide number three, <coughs> the diagnosis in this case was a uh, syringocyst adenoma papilloferum. Uh, you can see we have a fragmented uh, bread loved shade biopsy specimen. Uh, and as we move to higher power, we can see the surface of the specimen is papillomatous. There's some scale crust within the stratum corneum. And this uh, glandular neoplasm is attached to the overlying epidermis. And uh, if we focus in uh, on this area, we can see a characteristic change that I was looked for in uh, syringocyst adenoma papilliferum. And that is a transition from the stratified squamous epithelium of the epidermis to a glandular lining of these elongated branching tubules that are so characteristic of the syringocyst adenoma papilliferum. And if we look at the epithelium in this area, we can see it's uh, stratified and uh, kind of cuboidal to columnar with clear evidence of decapitation secretion uh, and certainly no interposition of a, a granular layer. So we've got that transition from stratified squamous to a glandular epithelium. Uh, in addition, I'm gonna erase that mark there, one can see that this tumor is really composed of these papillary fronds uh, that extend into these clear spaces. So we definitely have the, the uh, fronds and fjords uh, that are spoken of with this tumor. And if we look in the stroma of the papillary fronds, 
uh, characteristic of this tumor, we can see nodular aggregates of plasma cells with their uh, kind of clock face nuclei and uh, the localiz localization of the nucleus at the periphery of the cell with perinuclear clearing. Uh, so we do have uh, uh, very characteristic features here of a, uh, a syringocyst and metamopapillifer. This is an adnexal tumor which shows differentiation towards the secretory portion uh, of the sweat gland. And its close relative is the hydradenoma papillifer, which also is a tumor that belongs to the same family, shows differentiation towards the secretory portion of the sweat gland. Uh, and actually the, the papillary fronds have a very similar lining. What distinguishes the two, of course, is that a hydradenoma papillifer tends to have a very characteristic localization uh, in African rich areas, most commonly in the uh, female genitalia. There's no attachment to the overlying epidermis. So we have these papillary fronds located in a circumscribed dermal base tumor. And it has definitely a maze-like configuration. Uh, in addition, if, when you look at the stroma of the papillary fronds, there's no uh, significantly uh, significant inflammatory infiltrate. So we won't see these collections of plasma cells within the stroma of a hydradenoma papillary. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide number four. Slide number four uh, was a deep-seated dermal or subcutaneous tumor. Uh, the diagnosis in this case is a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. One can see that this neoplasm is very sharply circumscribed, has kind of a multi-lobulated uh, appearance. And uh, one can see that there are both hypo and hypercellular areas. The cells are embedded in an extremely uh, sclerotic stroma here, thick fiber stroma. And if we take a look at the uh, more cellular areas, we're just going to zoom right on in, you can see that we've got these, these plump uh, fibrocytes or fibroblasts with kind of oval to a fusiform shaped nuclei and a moderate amount of cytoplasm. Uh, they have a very um, uh, open chromatin pattern, kind of a vesicular appearance. There's not too much nuclear hyperchromatism uh, or pleomorphism. And the uh, cells are admixed with several osteoclast-like giant cells. And uh, here are some more of these osteoclast-like giant cells. These osteoclast-like giant cells uh, are unique in that they have a scalloped border, usually brightly eosinophilic nucleus, and they're just loaded with uh, nuclei. So they're very large, multinucleated cells, again, with the scalloped border. Another common feature of giant cell tumor of tendon sheath, and um, one can see it here. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. There are frequently scattered siderophages or macrophages containing hemosiderin pigment, uh, and sometimes even lipophages scattered throughout this uh, particular tumor. Uh, note the hemosiderin pigment is composed of granules that are a little more variable in size and shape than uh, melanin granules. Uh, of course, one could always do a Fontana and a Pearls iron stain to distinguish those two. But this is a very characteristic appearance of a giant cell tumor of tendon sheath. These, of course, tend to occur on the digits uh, and tend to be firmly adherent to the tendon sheath. Uh, schwannomas can uh, clinically bear some uh, resemblance to these. Sometimes they're painful, however. Uh, one can see uh, variants of giant cell tumors of tendon sheath that don't have giant cells. Uh, they're composed just only of these plump fibroblasts, and we call those tumors fibroma of tendon sheath. It's basically the same tumor. One has giant cells, one doesn't. And needless to say, these are large three-dimensional tumors that are, that they, these tumors are not like uh, homogenized milk. And so uh, the cellular components are not evenly distributed throughout the tumor. So if you section a tumor, you might have some sections that are very hypocellular and some sections that are just past packed with cells. And so that's why it's important to look uh, at all features and realize when you're looking at a given section, there may be some uh, variability uh, from case to case. Okay. 
Case number five is, uh, was a real nice example of uh, coccidiomycosis. Uh, this is a bisected uh, punch biopsy and even a low power, very skinny biopsy. Uh, you can see their scale crust and really pronounced pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. Uh, much of the hyperplasia taking origin from follicular epithelium. And if you look at our power, you can see it's pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus. There are collections of uh, neutrophils here. And well, you know, you can see pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia with pus in the setting of, you know, iododermas. Uh, generally, when we see it, we, we have a very high index of suspicion for infectious processes. And uh, if we go down and look in the dermis, uh, we can see we've got a real mixed cell infiltrate here. Not only are there neutrophils, there are histiocytes, a few of them multinucleated. There are some real small, ill-defined granulomas, lymphocytes, uh, and extravasated erythrocytes. I'm gonna go back to this uh, other piece uh, here as well. And when, you know, when you start hunting around here uh, and looking in the dermis, uh, you know, we, we kind of look in zones of necrosis. Uh, we look in uh, giant cells. And uh, when you start looking around, you begin in this particular case to see structures uh, like this. And here we have a very large spherule. I'm going to go to slightly higher power. Uh, with a very refractile wall and kind of this lacy blue-gray cytoplasm. And this is, this is diagnostic of uh, coccidiomycosis. Very large, this is in the realm of probably 40, 50, 60 microns. You can again see that we've got our RBC and our lymphocyte here, which are about five microns, much, much bigger. And the only organisms of this size that uh, you're going to see in tissue sections uh, are either going to be coxy or rhinosporidiosis. Personally, I've never seen a case of rhinosporidiosis. The organisms can bear some resemblance uh, to those of coxy, but they're huge. Whereas coxy tends to be about 10 to 80 microns, uh, rhinosporidiosis will be 100 to 150 microns. So it's, it's much, much bigger and much uh, less commonly uh, seen than coccidiomycosis. And if you take some time to look around, you'll see a few more uh, spherules uh, in, these, in these sections, but you gotta kind of hunt around. Um, when you are looking for infectious organisms, uh, neutrophilic microabscesses, zones of necrosis, and the cytoplasm of multinucleated histiocytes are, are, good, are good areas to focus on. Then let's go ahead and move on to slide six. Slide number six was kind of a tough case, I thought. Uh, this uh, was an example of porokeratosis tychotropica. And it's a, you know, a fairly recently recognized variant of porokeratosis. Uh, it's got a unique clinical presentation uh, as well, too, in that it, it is characterized by the presence of puritic papules and plaques uh, that um, preferentially involve the uh, gluteal cleft and the perianal regions, more common in men. And the lesions can actually get very, very large. And uh, a lot of times they're followed and misdiagnosed um, uh, for long periods of time before someone thinks about the possibility of uh, porokeratosis. Um, the histologic hallmark, and that's just the clinic, but the clinical uh, presentation is a little unusual, is uh, the histologic features are also a little bit unusual. Uh, routinely, uh, what's characteristic of all of the biopsies is a markedly thickened cornified layer. So there's usually quite a bit of compact, as one can see here, hyperkeratosis. Within the epidermis, you can see scattered dyskeratotic or dead red cells, okay? And the other thing one sees is coronoid lamella. And you can see right here, we've got a coronoid lamella, we've got a column of uh, perikeratosis beneath which the granular layer is absent, and we have these dyskeratotic cells beneath the perikeratotic stratum corneum. We have another one over here. And the thing that is unique about porokeratosis tychotropica is that the coronoid lamella are not located at the periphery of the lesion. They're scattered throughout the lesion, so it's not unusual to see two, three, or even more uh, lesions 
uh, or perikeratotic columns uh, in uh, a lesion of porokeratosis tychotropica. Uh, a lot of times, you know, what clues you into the diagnosis is the marked hyperkeratosis and uh, the uh, realization that the biopsy has come from a papule or plaque uh, on the uh, a long standing on the gluteal cleft or, or uh, uh, on the um, anogenital region. So, anyway, the clinical can help one uh, as well. So, poor keratosis, uh, tychotropica, compact ortho, dyskeratotic cells in the epidermis, and coronoid lamellae, which tend to be scattered uh, throughout the lesions. Um, okay, the, the, I was asked to repeat the name of the porokeratosis. It's porokeratosis tychotropica, okay? And that's P-T-Y-C-H-O-T-R-O-P-I-C-A. And we'll, uh, we'll post the answers when we uh, post the video, so it'll be written down for you. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to case number seven. Case number seven was a, a little more pedestrian, okay. Uh, oh, is that, and here's another question Mike asked, uh, is that much in, inflammatory infiltrate uh, a feature of the poor keratosis? Um, in my experience, let me go back, Mike, get to the right case. Um, yeah, I mean, usually because the lesions are puritic, uh, the, the, there's usually a lot of LSC <clears throat> and the patients are manipulating them a lot. So I think the the inflammation uh, is probably the consequence of uh, a puritis and repeated trauma to the area. So, and you know, think about DSAP and DSAP, you know, frequently you get a, a lichenoid infiltrate. So uh, yeah, it's usually most, most variants of poor keratosis are associated with a, with a pretty uh, risky lymphocytic infiltrate, at least in my experience. So hope that helps. Um, let's uh, go ahead and move on to Slide number uh, seven. Okay, slide number seven, like I said, it's a little bit more pedestrian. And uh, we have a shape biopsy here. I think we'll focus on this middle piece. This was trisected. And uh, the diagnosis in this case was lichen editis. And uh, one can see kind of a thin epidermis in areas. We have a little bit of perikeratosis. And then what's kind of striking is we have two discrete uh, foci of uh, nodular inflammatory infiltrates uh, within the papillary dermis. This one's kind of coalescing. And they're widening the dermal papillae and the, re the uh, epidermal reedy are kind of elongated and uh, encircling the infiltrate. So we've got the, the so-called ball and claw phenomenon here. Uh, let me go and clear this. And if we take a look at the inflammatory infiltrate, uh, one can see that there are histiocytes, uh, lymphocytes, a little bit of interface change, which I think is pretty common. Here we have a multinucleated histiocyte. And here, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of at the edge of one of these papules. Perhaps we have a coalescence of, of two papules in this one location, but this is very characteristic of, uh, of lichen and it is fairly distinct. Um, you know, on scan, if you, when you see the... Uh, the infiltrate localized here to the papillary dermis. Perhaps you could think about something like EH because it tends to widen the dermal papillae. In that case, of course, one would see neutrophils rather than histiocytes. Rarely, uh, cutaneous sarcoid uh, can really closely approximate the undersurface of the epidermis, but one wouldn't expect to see as many lymphocytes. And then finally, you know, you could briefly consider something like perforating granuloma annulari, but here we can see no erosion in the epidermis. And again, there are more lymphocytes uh, in these sections, usually with perforating GA. You see his C sites and a little bit of mucin, as well as evidence of transepidermal elimination. So I think those uh, could be eliminated. And our last case here was a, just a really nice example of Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And you know, Langerhans cell histiocytosis cytosis, uh, much as it can have a varied clinical presentation, also can have a markedly varied histologic presentation. So one can see uh, here a shape biopsy and uh, may have been bisected or quadrisected uh, or trisected, but it looks like it kind of fell apart. Uh, the epidermis is irregularly hyperplastic and one can see we've got a nodular and somewhat diffuse infiltrate 
uh, present within the dermis. And it looks like it's mixed. You know, if we look at this half of the specimen, we can see that we've got a lot of lymphocytes. And yet in other areas, uh, we can see that the cell uh, that dominates uh, the infiltrate is really uh, more epithelial. These cells look more histiocytic. They have abundant cytoplasm and large nuclei. And I'm going to go ahead and move to the bottom piece because uh, that uh, I'm going to flip it because this piece that was devoid of epidermis gives us a better look at the morphology uh, of these cells. Okay. So if we zoom on in, uh, one can see kind of these sheets of very discohesive large epithelioid cells that have a very histiocytic appearance. I'm going to zoom in a little bit higher here. And when we uh, take a look at these cells, uh, we can see, in addition, that there are uh, scattered eosinophils and lymphocytes. But when we take a look at these cells, you can see that the nuclei are quite irregular, okay? Some of them are notched, some of them are lobulated, some of them are grooved, and some of them do have a reniform appearance. And it's been my experience with Langerhans cell histiocytosis. I mean, occasionally you'll see an infiltrate that has tons of reniform nuclei, but a lot of times you have to hunt around to see the reniform nuclei. But if you see these large kind of discohesive histiocytic cells kind of floating in space here, you know, most of these are surrounded by space and their nuclei are a little irregular and you see eosinophils from the infiltrate, you need to have a super high index of suspicion for Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Now let's go back to this other piece here. And again, excuse me, I'm gonna flip it again. But this infiltrate really, if you look at it in areas is a little epidermotropic and a little folliculotropic. So you can see some of these histiocytes kind of crashing into the epidermis and working their way up into the overlying epidermis. And that's a real common common, uh, a real common finding with Langerhans cell histiocytosis as well. And that's why the, the lesions are frequently eroded. Of course, in this instance, we want to do our requisite immunohistochemical stains. We want to do um, S100 CD1A and, and at times CD207 or uh, Langerhans. So we did have a question here. Are plasma cells a component of Langerhans cell histiocytosis? Good question, Marcus. I mean, I think sometimes you, you can see them. You know, sometimes they're a function of location but I don't routinely look for plasma cells and Langerhans cell histiocytosis. I think what to me happens sometimes is that some of the Langerhans cells can look very plasma cytoid, especially if the nuclei is off to the periphery of the cell and there's a little clearing. So I think some of those cells are probably the Langerhans cells, uh, of the part of the neoplastic infiltrate rather than uh, plasma cells. So at least that's been uh, my experience. So I hope the session was helpful. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, as is always the case, uh, please feel free to, to shoot me any questions. And I hope everybody has a good evening. I'll be on the lookout for the CPC cases uh, next week. Thanks so much. Have a good evening.